The same way that the internet took all of these separate information networks and turned them into one, Bitcoin is going to take all of these separate monetary networks and turn them into one. No intro today, guys. You know why you're here. Timestamps are down on the timeline if you want to jump around. Let's just get into it. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is just a ledger or a record of who owns what. And it's decentralized, which means that there's a full copy of this entire ledger on a bunch of different computers throughout the whole world. About every 10 minutes, the ledger is updated when a new block of transactions transactions is added to the chain that records the history and the state of the Bitcoin network. And because the blocks are chained together, you can look back through the entire history of Bitcoin and see who owned what at every 10 minute increment period since the beginning of Bitcoin. So for example, if in this 10 minutes, I have one Bitcoin and you have five Bitcoins and you pay me one of your five Bitcoins, then in the next 10 minutes, the state of the ledger will show that I now have two Bitcoins and you only have four Bitcoins. And when that new block gets created, including our transaction, every computer in the world that's running Bitcoin will update and show that now Rhett has two Bitcoins and viewer of Rhett's YouTube channel has four Bitcoins. The blocks of transactions are added about every 10 minutes by what are called Bitcoin miners, which are just computers that are running the proof of work consensus algorithm. Basically, these computers are just spending a lot of electricity doing calculations to make sure that no one double spends their Bitcoin or sends any fake transactions into the network. Spending the electricity is important because it means that no one is going to be willing to send fake transactions because that's gonna cost them real tangible resources in real life. They're not ever going to be able to get that electricity that they spent on mining back. The vast majority of industrial scale Bitcoin miners pretty much only set up their miners in joint operations with renewable energy providers, utility providers, and grid operators. This fixes a big problem in the renewable energy sector. Renewable energy generators need something called a base load consumer, which basically is just there to eat up any of the extra electricity that is generated by any of these renewable energy centers. More and more today, these baseload consumers are becoming Bitcoin miners because that's the next most profitable use for the excess energy. If you guys want to learn more about Bitcoin mining, I'll leave some resources down in the description and let me know down in the comments if you guys want a deep dive on any aspect of Bitcoin mining. Now that we understand what Bitcoin is and where it comes from, next let's talk about what problems the Bitcoin network solves. Bitcoin today is kind of like the early internet. Pre-internet, there were a lot of different communications networks. There was the Houston Chronicle, there was the LA Times, there was the New York Times, wherever you live probably had a local newspaper and all of those newspapers came out at different times of the week and on their own schedules. And if you wanted news more quickly than that, there was the nightly news. And maybe in some places in the middle of nowhere or in authoritarian regimes, there were only underground sources of news or messages that were carried from one person directly to someone else by a pigeon. These newspapers though needed a ton of overhead to generate their product. The biggest issue was that they needed to generate the same number of papers as there was demand for the paper. So if there were only a thousand readers, they needed to generate a thousand newspapers. But if there were a million readers, they needed to generate a million copies of the same newspaper. And then they had the huge logistical challenge of having to distribute all of those newspapers to all of the different people who wanted the newspaper. Finally, when the internet came out, any single person had the ability to message any other single person throughout the entire world. And we didn't have to rely on these segmented newspapers paper networks to distribute information. And on the internet, you could use Yahoo Mail, or you could use Gmail, or you could use Microsoft Outlook. And these were all applications that were built on top of the single internet message access protocol. The best part about publishing and distributing news through the internet was that when you wanted to create a story, you only needed to create it once, and then you could distribute it as many times as you wanted to. There was zero marginal cost to replicating what you've already written. It took the distribution model of information from print once, sell once to a print once, sell twice model. If I make this YouTube video, I don't have to make it a thousand times for a thousand people to watch it. I just make it once and then a thousand people watch it. But in the old day, if you wanted a thousand people to read your newspaper article, you had to print the same article a thousand times and then distribute it to those exact a thousand people that were interested in the content. Today in 2022, we have all of these segmented monetary networks across the world that settle at different times and use different currencies. And it's really hard to make Make them talk to each other. And you know this, if you've ever tried to send an international wire transfer, it's basically impossible. Western Union needs physical branches in 200 different countries just to be able to facilitate cross-border payments. Even new cross-border payment companies like TransferWise have the same problem fundamentally because they're built on the same layers that Western Union and these other legacy banks are built on top of. To facilitate payments, these companies have to hold lots of cash in all the different jurisdictions that they operate in. So in all of these 200 countries that 
markets are operating in, they're holding a bunch of euros and a bunch of dollars and a bunch of yen. And if you want to transfer dollars into euros, they're hoping that at the same time or about the same time, someone wants to transfer the exact same amount of euros back into dollars. And so then they don't need to move any money around. They can just settle things instantly by saying, Rhett wanted to send $5 to Europe and someone in Europe wanted to send $5 to someone else in America. So we can just keep these balances where they are and we don't have to actually physically move any of the money. And this is why when the transfer that you're trying to make is really small, they have a really good chance of guaranteeing that it's going to happen on the same day because lots of people are making small transfers back and forth. So it's likely that they'll be able to find a match for your transaction going the opposite way. But if the transfer is really big, they have a hard time telling you how long it's going to take for that transaction to clear because they don't know when the opposite amount of money is going to travel in your direction. This problem is called balance sheet float and it's what makes these traditional payment rails so inefficient. Western Union passes these costs off to their customers in the form of slow payments and high fees to make transactions. This is similar to how Visa passes their costs off to merchants in the form of their 3% card processing fees. And contrary maybe to popular belief, Western Union and Visa aren't doing this because they're evil rent-seeking capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing it because it's the only way that they can afford to provide the service that they provide. If you think about it, if Visa goes from charging 3% to merchants to 2% to merchants, that's a 33% reduction in all of the money that they make. And they wouldn't be able to operate with those kinds of margins. For a concrete example of the limitations of the current system, let's say you're at a bar in Houston and your friend in Australia wants to buy you a beer. Currently, they can't do that because cross-border payments are so slow and unreliable that they would be impossible to use for consumer level transactions. I'm not gonna be at the bar for a week or a month. I'm probably only gonna be at the bar for an hour. And so that transaction needs to clear very quickly. Western Union handles cross-border payments, but they don't handle consumer transactions. And Visa handles consumer transactions, but they don't handle cross-border payments. And it would be really hard for Visa to break into the cross-border payments market, just like it would be really hard for Western Union to break into the consumer payments market. Because there are so many fixed costs and banking relationships and money that they would have to set up in these different jurisdictions to be able to do the job that they currently don't do. And if one of the companies got into the space of the other company, they would be competing against someone that's already very good and well optimized at doing that job. And it would be very hard for them to break into the market. They'd be at a huge disadvantage right off the bat. So how does Bitcoin fix this? Now with Bitcoin, we have one single monetary network that everyone in the world can access at the same time. So if you're at that bar in Houston and your buddy in Australia wants to buy you a beer, they can just just package up their Bitcoin and zip it to you across the Lightning Network and pay for your beer using a QR code. The Lightning Network is a layer two solution on top of Bitcoin that allows you to zip around Bitcoin instantly and for fractions of a penny. But let's put Lightning aside for now because if we talk about it in this video, this video is going to get way too cluttered. Definitely go down below and leave a comment if you do want me to do this style of video for Lightning in the future. So if I send my buddy in Australia a QR code, he can pay for my beer here in Houston. But what I could also do is just take a picture of the QR code and post it on Twitter or any other application on the internet and anyone that sees that QR code can take whatever their local currency is turn it into Bitcoin, pay the QR code, and then my beer has been paid for by anyone in the world instantly and for basically zero cost. And these instant global transfers are only possible because we now have one single monetary network for the transfer of value for the entire planet. The same way that the internet took all of these separate information networks and turned them into one, Bitcoin is going to take all of these separate monetary networks and turn them into one. Before Bitcoin, companies like Cash App couldn't send money to companies like Venmo because those are two different closed networks. But now that Cash App has made one single integration with the Bitcoin Lightning Network, they can now send money to any other application that has also integrated the Bitcoin Lightning Network, like Strike, for example. And if any bar or small business in the world hooked up their point of sale system to the Bitcoin Lightning Network, you could instantly use Cash App or any of the other applications that have integrated the Lightning Network to pay that point of sale system. If El Salvador as a country implements the Lightning Network for most of their major merchants, merchants, which they have already done, Cash App users now instantly have access to pay at any of those merchants using their own local currency. Cash App didn't have to open an office in El Salvador. Cash App didn't have to hire people in El Salvador. They both just singularly made the same integration to the Bitcoin network, and now anyone with Cash App can pay at any business in El Salvador. Cash App just made one integration to the Bitcoin Lightning Network and became a cheaper and faster way to remit money internationally than Western Union. And in this case, Cash App is 
always going to be more efficient than Western Union because Cash App doesn't need an entire physical branch and all of these overhead and fixed costs that Western Union has in having to keep cash in all the jurisdictions that they operate. All of that has been abstracted away because the global liquidity of the Bitcoin market is where they're keeping the cash. Cash App doesn't have to do anything but wait for other countries to adopt the Lightning Network and then Cash App will work in all of those places. And in the same way that making that one integration to the Lightning Network made them cheaper and faster than Western Union, it also makes them cheaper and faster for consumer payments than Visa. If I spend US dollars over the Bitcoin Lightning Network to pay for something in El Salvador, the merchant is keeping 100% of that cost. There isn't some 3% card processing fee that's getting charged to them by Visa. This section of the video might have been really complicated and a lot for you to take in. So if you do want to learn more, I'll have a series of videos down in the description where you can hear Jack Mahlers, the CEO of Strike, explain this to you for himself. So definitely check that out if you are looking to learn more. I've managed to go this entire video now without talking about Bitcoin as an asset. So at the end of the video here, let's quickly cover that. The currency of the capital B Bitcoin network that we just talked about is lowercase b Bitcoin. This is very confusing and someone could have done a lot better with the branding here. But basically the thing that you're buying on cryptocurrency exchanges like Coinbase Pro and Gemini is the cryptocurrency lowercase b Bitcoin that travels on the uppercase b Bitcoin network that we just talked about. The key economic features to lowercase b Bitcoin the asset are First, the total fixed supply of Bitcoin. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in existence. Secondly, the predictable inflation schedule. New Bitcoin are added to the economy about every 10 minutes when a new block is mined. And you can predict with very great accuracy the total supply of Bitcoin and transparently see how much Bitcoin is in circulation, which you can't really do with almost any other commodity. And the third really important aspect of Bitcoin is the halving cycles. The new Bitcoin that get added to the economy of Bitcoin every 10 minutes gets cut in half about every four years. These economic properties make Bitcoin the asset a very powerful economic savings tool because it's the only thing in the world that people can't make more of. Prior to Bitcoin, the hardest thing to make more of was gold. However, if everyone in the world wanted more gold, price of gold would increase, and then the price that miners were willing to pay to extract more gold from the earth would also increase, and so they would go mine more gold, and that would lower the price of gold. So if more people want more gold, more people go mine gold, price of gold goes up, but then more gold is added to the supply because it's mined price comes back down. A simple way of saying this is that as demand for gold increases, the supply of gold also increases to meet that demand, which has the effect of dampening and stabilizing the gold price. Barring any big external influences, the exact same thing is going to happen in most commodity markets, including silver and copper and corn and wheat and flour. But if the demand for Bitcoin exponentially increases, which it has over the last 10 years, the supply of Bitcoin is impossible to increase. And so those run-ups in demand can't be met by run-ups in supply. And so the run-ups in demand are are met by instead a run up in price. When the supply of dollars or other fiat currencies across the world increases by 30% a year, like it has in the last couple of years during the pandemic, people saving all of their money in dollars lose equivalent amounts of their purchasing power. If there's a million dollars of money in circulation and you have $1, and now there's $2 million in circulation and you have still $1, you've actually lost purchasing power versus the previous money supply. So what smart investors and rich people will do is park their cash into other assets that they think are not going to inflate as quickly as the US dollar. And these things could include tech stocks or real estate or gold or oil. All of these things should theoretically increase in price faster than the dollar because they're being inflated slower than the dollar. But tech stocks, real estate, gold, and oil all have the exact same problem that if demand for them gets too high, supply for them will also increase. And that increase of supply and demand at the same time will help keep prices lower. Apple or Google or GameStop stop can just issue new shares and dilute your equity holdings of their companies whenever they want. The same thing happens in real estate. As demand for real estate increases, the supply of building new real estate increases, and that should theoretically over time keep prices lower. And then like we talked about, gold miners will go get more gold. And as for oil and energy producers, if the price of oil got too high, they would go find gas or solar or wind or some other commodity to help keep energy prices low. And at the end of the day, if demand increases too much, they could just drill for more oil. Bitcoin is the only un withable commodity on the planet. For more information on Bitcoin the Asset and Bitcoin the Network, I highly recommend that you go read Jason Williams' book, Bitcoin Hard Money You Can't With. It's a very quick and easy read. If you are more economically minded or you're looking for something a little bit deeper, I suggest you go check out The Bitcoin Standard by Saifedean Amous. Links to both of those books will be down in the description. Hopefully this video was helpful for you guys and it answered a lot of your questions about Bitcoin. If it did, go down below and leave it a like so that YouTube will share it around to other people who need to still learn what
what Bitcoin is and how it works. If you guys do have questions, feel free to go down below and leave a comment. I do still respond to all the comments. And then come back here every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern for a new video. I love you all. Goodbye.